Revelation chapter 11 verse 3 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. The Bible in Revelation chapter 11 introduces two pivotal figures called the two witnesses. They appear in prophetic attire of sackcloth, symbolizing repentance, and are empowered to fulfill their ministry with great effectiveness. Throughout history, even in the most challenging and corrupt eras, God has consistently appointed witnesses to bear testimony. Throughout history, there have been significant examples such as Noah, who preached righteousness for 120 years before the flood. Abraham and Cain and Joseph in Egypt, judges like Gideon in Israel's times of moral decline, Elijah during Ahab and Jezebel's reign, and Daniel in Babylon. This tradition continues today with believers worldwide serving as witnesses. Revelation 7.1.10 mentions the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel who have embraced the task of spreading the gospel worldwide. Revelation 11.3 introduces two unique witnesses renowned for their unwavering dedication to proclaiming the gospel. While their identities spark various theories from symbolic representations like the Law and the Prophets or the Old and New Testaments to specific historical figures the text itself does not explicitly name them. Among the commonly speculated identities are Elijah and Moses or possibly Enoch and Elijah, given their profound historical and scriptural significance. The ongoing debate about their identities is fueled by hints in scripture and religious tradition. For instance, Malachi 4.5.6 mentions Elijah's return before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, adding to the speculation. Elijah, along with Moses, was present at Jesus' transfiguration, documented in Matthew 17.2.3. This event connects them to significant moments in biblical history. Additionally, both Moses and Elijah performed miracles akin to those described in Revelation 11, such as influencing weather patterns and initiating plagues, which parallel the actions of the two witnesses. Elijah's suitability is further supported by his unique departure from earthly life without experiencing death, a distinction shared only with Enoch, making them both figures of notable eschatological significance. The account of Michael the Archangel contending with the devil over Moses' body, found in Jude 1 9, adds a mystical dimension to Moses' potential role as a witness. However, it's crucial to acknowledge that the identities of the two witnesses remain unknown to us. God has the power to equip anyone with the required attributes. These witnesses might be believers, figures from Scripture, or entirely new creations appointed by God. His abilities surpass our comprehension, and only He holds the knowledge of who these witnesses truly are. This mystery is explored further in Revelation 11, 4, 14. These are the descriptions of the two witnesses they are likened to two olive trees and two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Anyone who tries to harm them will be met with fire that comes from their mouths, devouring their adversaries. They have the authority to close the sky so that it does not rain during their prophetic ministry and they can turn water into blood and unleash plagues on the earth as often as they choose. After they complete their testimony, the beast from the abyss will wage war against them, ultimately prevailing and killing them. Their bodies will be left in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. People from all nations and languages will witness their dead bodies for three and a half days, refusing to allow them to be buried. The inhabitants of the earth will rejoice over their deaths, celebrating and exchanging gifts, because these two prophets had troubled them. However, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, causing great fear among those who saw them. Then a voice from heaven called out to them, saying, Come up here, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched. At that moment, a great earthquake occurred, causing a tenth of the city to collapse, resulting in the deaths of seven thousand people. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. This marks the passing of the second woe. And now, the third woe approaches swiftly. This prophecy depicts a time of global turmoil when a dictator, known as the Beast, will rise to power. He will manipulate public opinion and use religious deceit to consolidate his authority, likely leveraging mass media as a potent tool to achieve his objectives. Consider Revelation 11.9, which describes a moment when people from diverse nations and languages witness an event simultaneously a concept that seemed inconceivable two centuries ago. How could individuals from around the world witness the same event simultaneously? Today, this scenario is entirely plausible due to advancements in technology. In the present day, modern technology enables us to witness love events from any corner of the globe. Whether through television or digital devices like smartphones and tablets, people can now follow unfolding events in real time, irrespective of their geographical location. This capability is remarkably in line with the prophecy found in Revelation 11.9, 
which predicts that individuals from diverse nations, languages, and cultures will witness the bodies of the two witnesses for three and a half days. The ability for such a global audience to observe events simultaneously underscores the accuracy of this biblical prophecy. When this prophecy was first recorded nearly 2,000 years ago, the technology we now take for granted televisions, computers, smartphones was entirely unimaginable. The idea of video calls or streaming live footage worldwide would have been completely alien and beyond comprehension at that time. This fulfillment not only highlights technological progress but also underscores the precision of prophetic scriptures. It illustrates how biblical prophecies can unfold in ways initially beyond human comprehension, only to be clarified as society and technology advance. Consider explaining to someone from 2,000 years ago that in the future people would see and communicate with each other live across vast distances using handheld devices or screens in their homes it would have seemed fantastical. Yet today we witness events unfolding in real time, mirroring descriptions in Revelation, showcasing the prophetic accuracy of Scripture. The global viewing of the two witnesses is a compelling example of how prophecy transcends time, aligning ancient predictions with modern capabilities. The two witnesses have the authority to prophesy for 1,260 days, about three and a half years, while dressed in sackcloth, a symbol of mourning and repentance. They are endowed with divine powers to defend themselves and fulfill their mission. They can control the weather, preventing rain during their prophetic period, and have the ability to turn water into blood and bring plagues upon the earth as needed. They serve as both protectors and proclaimers of God's message during a significant period of tribulation. Ultimately, they meet their demise. In verse 9, the phrase peoples and tribes and tongues and nations indicates that people worldwide will witness the bodies of the two witnesses, likely through satellite television or other forms of visual media. In a disturbing display of hostility, the world will refuse to bury their bodies for three and a half days. This act of disdain will be celebrated by followers of the Antichrist, who will rejoice in his perceived victory over the two prophets that caused droughts and preach the unwelcome message of the gospel. This event will spark widespread celebrations globally, with people rejoicing, exchanging gifts, and treating it like a holiday, demonstrating a profound aversion to the gospel. This response underscores a common misunderstanding the belief that a powerful revelation from God would lead people to repent and follow Him. However, as Revelation illustrates, even when God's power is clearly demonstrated, many still choose to reject Him. This stubbornness reflects a harsh reality of human resistance, mirroring attitudes seen in today's world where some react with hostility towards the gospel message. Ironically, this instance of rejoicing is the only one mentioned in the book of Revelation. People are not celebrating a positive event, but rather the demise of the prophets who confronted them with God's judgment, displayed miraculous powers, and called for repentance. This reaction vividly illustrates the depth of their rejection of God's message. Turning to the resurrection of the two witnesses, as the world watches, these individuals suddenly rise up, instilling fear in all who witness it. Remember, the world had been observing and celebrating their deaths as their bodies lay in the streets. The shock of seeing them come back to life would send shockwaves globally, especially as the media broadcast the event. Scripture records that great fear gripped those who saw them, starkly contrasting the earlier joy at their demise. The aftermath is filled with a blend of surprise, shock, and dismay among unbelievers, occurring just three and a half days after the witnesses are killed by the beast. In a scene reminiscent of God breathing life into Adam, he revives his witnesses, prompting them to rise to their feet. Being too righteous for the world, God calls them to ascend to heaven in a cloud. Simultaneously, a significant earthquake occurs, symbolizing judgment and prompting many to acknowledge God's power. However, whether this acknowledgement leads to genuine repentance and salvation remains uncertain. While survivors of the earthquake give glory to God, it does not necessarily indicate true worship or honor. They acknowledge His power, yet there is no clear sign of repentance. The world's reaction is one of awe and fear, acknowledging God's might through their responses but lacking a genuine commitment to honor Him. So what are the tasks these witnesses will undertake? Firstly, they possess the power to testify, they are referred to as the two witnesses because God has uniquely empowered them for this task. Testifying is not a simple duty. It requires divine empowerment. These individuals will deliver sermons of unprecedented impact. Consider the most powerful sermon you've ever heard, it will pale in comparison to what these men will preach. I remember a preacher from my childhood in a small gospel town. His vivid sermons on hell were so compelling that it felt like the temperature in the church rose, urging the congregation to repent. His ability to depict the reality of hellfire was unmatched. Similarly, these two witnesses will preach with an unparalleled power and conviction. 
Their messages will convey profound truths, which is why they will be despised. As noted in John 3.19, people often prefer darkness over light, showing that truth often provokes hostility from those who choose ignorance. They will have the ability to breathe fire from their mouths. Secondly, the two witnesses possess the power to manipulate the weather. Similar displays of power can be found in the Bible through figures like Elijah and Joshua. God empowered Elijah to bring about droughts, while Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. Like them, these two witnesses have the ability to control rainfall, demonstrating mastery over the seasons a formidable skill that renders them nearly impervious to harm. Why would God bestow such abilities upon these witnesses? Their mission is to affirm that Jesus is the Son of God, who died and rose again. To persuade people of their divine commission, they must perform signs that surpass mere illusions like card tricks or disappearing acts, which could be dismissed as mere sleight of hand. Instead, their command over nature signifies a divine power akin to that of a creator.